Good evening. I'll call the meeting to order for the purpose of electing a chair and I'll accept nominations at this time. Councilor Neal. Aye. Is there a seconder? Councilor Osanek and Councilor Stroud, would you accept the nomination? I do. Are there any other nominations at this time? Seeing none, I'll close the nomination and I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries. And I'll now accept nominations for vice chair. Councilor Stroud. I nominate Jim Neal. Councilor Neal. Is there a seconder? Councilor Shell. And are there any other notion, motions to come forward? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor, opposed, and that carries. Welcome, Councillor Holland. Uh, we're at item two, calling to order. Uh, you, you missed the election of officers, so if you wanted to be one of the officers, you've missed it. Sorry. <laughs> um, we need to approve the agenda, and uh, I hear from the clerk that there's a, staff is asking for a change in the agenda to uh, move the item 7A, the briefing, uh, after 8A in business. Okay. Yeah. So the first item would be 8A and the second item would, would be 7A and then continue on. Uh, so I guess I need a mover for that. Okay, so any discussion? So we're, we're voting on a slight rearranging of the first two items of the agenda to reverse the order. Start with 8A and then go 7A. All those in favor? And that carries. So first up then is 8A Community Bike Share Program with the uh, report and there's recommendation with three clauses and I'll go to staff to uh, introduce the, the item. Go ahead. Thank you and through you Mr. Chair. Uh, I think the report speaks mostly for itself but uh, it does cover the performance of the Drop Bike Community Bike Share pilot program over the course of the summer which we regarded as positive. Uh, and it sets out uh, some observations that we have made through public consultation and through um, our own observations of how the drop bike program uh, happened. Uh, it also, the report also sets out a terms of reference that we would like to use uh, for a request for proposals process to attract a community bike share operator to Kingston in 2018. Um, the terms of reference that are in, within the report would represent a minimum standard. Um, we would expect because of the nature of a request for proposals that um, we could get large variations uh, in terms of business models and size, quality of bikes, those sorts of things. But the, uh, as I said, the terms of reference represents uh, uh, what we would like to see as a minimum standard. Great, thank you. Very uh, interesting arrival of a new uh, pilot, and we've now got the report here. Uh, there are several recommendations, but first we'll go to questions from members of the committee on the report to staff. Do I see any questions? Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple. On uh, page seven of 10, the, um, it talks about um, most, it was, this is a survey that was done. I don't know how many people were involved. Do we have, do we have the number of people that were respondents? I see percentages, but I don't see the number. Yes, Mr. McClatchy. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, there was 92 respondents to the survey in total. Then when it says most also saw advertising on a bike share system as acceptable, what does most mean? Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just going to uh, consult the public consultation report and I can answer that question in a minute. Okay, we're just gonna wait for the detailed response. The question was uh, related to the fourth bullet at the top of page seven of 10. Most also saw advertising on a bike share system as acceptable. And Mr. Chair, uh, that was uh, 50 respondents saw advertising on the system as acceptable, and that's uh, seven, just over 73% of the response. Yeah, and there was only 68 responses to that particular question. So 50 out of 68 responses uh, answered the survey in that way. Do you have another question? Okay, so not everybody answered. Not the, I thought you said there were 92 respondents altogether, but not all of them answered that question. Correct. That, Only yeah. 68 chose to answer that particular question. Okay, and then what does most mean below that? Most respondents indicated preference for a private sector partner owning and operating the bike share system, or had no preference. So I'm looking down the road to what that might mean. So um, private sector partner owning and operating the bike share system. So that was a preference, but then apparently the no prefer preference were counted in with that sector of the respondents. What's the breakdown? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, there were 67 people responded to that particular question. 34% mm -hmm. um, of those, or 23 respondents, indicated that they preferred a private sector partner owning and operating, and 20 respondents, or 29.9%, indicated no preference. Okay, leaving 24. Yes, uh, 15. That they said they didn't want it. 15% indicated municipality should be the owner and operator. 13% um, uh, indicated a not for profit partner should be sought to own and operate. And then a small five people said some other approach. Okay, so. Um, I'll just note that that gives you a different impression than, than a, that is stated. So um, just let me see now. Did you have another question? Yeah, yeah I have one other question. I just had to find it. So under accessibility considerations, it says accessibility provisions will be included as a required element of the community bike share request for proposals. I was just wondering what that means. Like, what kind of requirements will we make? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to start with, um, since this would be a system that operates on the public right of way, there would have to be compliance with the facility accessibility design standard. Uh, but in general terms, we would want to make sure that racks and so forth were not placed in such a way that it would impose any sort of impediment to any, anybody with a, an accessibility uh, challenge. Okay, so it's mostly got to do with bike parking? Mostly with bike parking, um, but also with the system itself. So the bicycles and any apps uh, that, were, that were there um, to use the system, given, given the context of who would be using the system, um, taking that into consideration. Okay, I guess I'll have to wait and see what that actually comes to. Um, I'm just not quite sure how accessibility is affected. I can see the bikes, either you can ride it or you can't, right? Okay, and the apps, either you can push the right button so you can't, right? So I'm just I'm not, like I can see where we have stairwells and then we have ramps, right? That's a whole thing. Correct, the, There's not much the main focus here. of the accessibility consideration within this report is the placement of, of racks on the right of way. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Next I see uh, Councillor Neal. Thank you. Um, I, I think overall the pilot was very successful. We saw lots of bikes on the road. Um, my couple of concerns that I hope will be addressed, it seemed to be primarily, and it made sense as a pilot, 
that it was very centered on Queen's University and the BIA area. And I know that gradually, because of certain demands, uh, some of the orange bikes started to turn out in Williamsville, which I applauded at the time. But do we have some assurance, or will the RFP make sure that we have west end, east end, north end coverage? Perhaps not with as many bikes if the market doesn't seem to suggest that, but can we insist that somebody can pick up a bike at Cataract Way or, or uh, at North End Kingston or the Kingston Center, for instance? So through you, Mr. Chair, um, the terms of reference that are being recommended within this report um, describe the minimum service area for a community bike share that we would be comfortable with, but it also specifies that the bike share needs to be compatible with our uh, Kingston Transit Rack and Roll program. So I would expect um, community bike share operators will look at the opportunities available within our community um, and certainly places like uh, the CAT Center I would think would be attractive to them uh, when, when it's linked with the, uh, the Rack and Roll program. So those transit hubs would be logical places to also have bike share? We want proponents that are responding to the RFP to examine the community uh, and determine what's going to work for them uh, to be able to, to run a, uh, a feasible community bike share program. Um, but certainly I think transit hubs would be, would be a central focus to an operator as well as the types of corridors, the downtown business improvement area plus Queens plus St. Lawrence. Those seem to be logical places of, of high student density and high um, active transportation and, and, and cycling demand. And the other thing that I brought up when they did their original presentation, and they said they were considering ways to address the issue, uh, the drop bike system, only people with smartphones and only people with credit cards would have access to it. And that limits, uh, for many people, how accessible, broadly accessible that is in the city. Uh, have you heard any more talk from Drop Bike, or would it be within the RFP that at least we ask them to try and address those issues? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the RFP will explicitly state that we l we are looking for solutions to to equity and accessibility issues like that. Um, to be honest, I've heard all of the bike operators talking about it, bike share operators that is talking about it. I haven't seen solid examples of how it's working yet, but uh, we will ask the question and, and, and uh, look for those kinds of solutions. Thank you. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, um, yeah, great, great, great results. It seems that the uptake really was most prominent um, and the report verifies around September and that students really, uh, Queen's campus in particular, really liked this option. So I guess the question I have, one is very, very sort of far advanced, kind of strategic, but thinking about um, Queen's ridership, partnering with Queen's, that sort of thing, and potentially, and also just thinking about any impacts, because I think it would be, I guess what I'm getting at is I think it would be wise to be uh, in dis to discuss with the AMS, and I know that, for example, the, um, the transit pass, the Queen's, that that is a really important part of our transit system, being able to continually rely on those revenues, and, and, and I'm not saying that every Queen student is going to be on a bike instead of on the bus, but just sort of thinking long term and trying to figure out uh, what what those numbers might mean and how they might, with bike sharing being a bigger part of that that portion, what that might look like. So through you, Mr. Chair, certainly um, we have consulted with um, Queen's University, and they are very keen on a community bike share program being in their in their uh, district, and they've committed to. 
uh, working with the city to make sure that it's a consistent system across the city and don't have one for the university and one for the city. Um, what else can I say about that? The, uh, the integration with Kingston Transit is going to be important, and the RFP, as it's stated in the report, will ask for uh, demonstrations of how proposed systems are going to integrate with Kingston Transit. So it may not just be integration with rag and roll. It may be an integration with a, or at least a desire to seek a, uh, an integration with the transit pass system. Councillor Holland, did you have any other questions? No. Councillor Shell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's it's quite a list of. Uh, Terms of reference and request for in the request for proposals, are there enough bike share companies that uh, we can expect to see this list fulfilled, or do you expect that we're going to have to make a number of compromises? I mean, it must be an incredibly capital-intensive business for any group to try to and then to try to fit all these criteria, or is it going to be easy? <laughs> you, Mr. Chair. I think there's a spectrum of, of effort or at least investment from different types of business models in the bike share world right now, from the truly dockless systems like we saw with Drop Bike to more capital intensive systems like Bixie and Toronto Bike Share. Um, but to answer your question, I would expect we would see at least five or six um, respondents to this. I, th I think that the community bike share world has taken notice of the fact that um, our, our engineering department was successful in, in, in getting funding towards active transportation projects, which could include community bike share. So I think the, the community bike share community is going to recognize that and they may, they may sense that there's an appetite to, to put municipal dollars into this. Although right now the, the request for proposals is looking for a system that that minimizes operating and capital investment by the city. But I'm, I'm confident we'll, uh, we'll see uh, five or six respondents to this. That's encouraging. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? I have a question. So I see that uh, the engineering department was consulted in uh, prepare, preparation of this report, and I know uh, Mr. McClatchy, you were the lead on this file. Um, because of the synergies with transit, and already brought up by some of my colleagues here, I'm wondering, will you be, uh, before the RFP goes out, will transit department itself be consulted about, about how specifically to word the RFP so that it could be transit compatible? Uh, certainly. One of the things we learned through the drop bike pilot was that operation of a bike share program on the right of way affects more than one city department. Um, so there are different departments that will have a stake in this and different departments have to have um, their say on the RFP and not just the wording of the RFP, but how, how the successful proponent might be selected. So um, yes, there will be a, a, a good consultation across several departments in the city that will have a stake in this. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Because clearly, um, whether you, if you're getting from, if you look at the bike share as a mode of transportation, uh, then it's operating in parallel with whatever transit system we have. And even though a bike can fit on a, on a bus with the rack and roll, it's not necessarily the only way that a bike share can interact with transit. Uh, having the docks at the transit hubs, for example. Uh, is, is another way, but there's also the return of those same bikes to the racks. If you're using it as the last kilometer transportation to where transit maybe doesn't get you exactly, like from an express hub to, to an end, uh, which would be a residence, you don't have a rack necessarily there to park the bike. So that's fairly important to the RFP process. And I, I know that I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but just... Uh, the two ends of the the two ends of the transit process, like the, the destination and the and the origin, uh, transit analysis looks at that, and that's why I think it's very important that the transit department be consulted with this. If there's any thought of it being integrated closely with with the transit that we have, thank you. 
I, don't, I know that was a comment, I just, it was relevant to my question, so I thought I'd add it at that point. Uh, any members of the public? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks to staff for the report and the questions and the good debate so far. Um, I think this is a brilliant success. Um, really good cooperation between staff and council and the company that's offering this, and the public seems to recognize that. Um, it's really innovative, and I'm really pleased about that. Um, now, um, just to, I've got a few points. Uh, uh, most of them haven't been come up uh, so far, but one thing I have noticed is that at some of the locations where the bikes are, are kept, the wind seems to blow them over. I've noticed this quite a number of times, or maybe people are coming by and knocking them over. So I'm just wondering if, if damage is caused because of that. Um, I didn't see it in the report, so maybe you know, it could be added in. Um, the report, I think, is very good uh, insofar as it goes. I'm just wondering if it might be, have some more information on um, European and or Asian experience in terms of the uptake levels, because I think Europe was the uh, pioneer in this, perhaps, or, or perhaps maybe Hong Kong, places like that, you know, that are very densely populated. So just to give an, an indication of where we're going, say, in five or ten years from now, um, because as technology evolves, it makes other options in running one's life possible, right? You don't need a car, you have this on transit. You need to get around, you can get to larger cities by train or bus, maybe you gotta rent a car now and then, so. I noticed that some people actually took them home and they locked them outside their buildings. You see this in Williamsville sometimes, right? You see the same bike outside the same apartment building all the time, so. I'm not sure if that had been uh, thought of as, as possible, but you know, they just use their own lock, right? Lock it to a post or whatever, so. Um, I'm wondering if we kept track of looking by the locations every so often to see how many bikes were left. Say if you have 10 that you know that are at a certain location, did you go by and see how many were being used or if they were all gone or if they were all left at any, any one point? I didn't really see that in, in the report. Um, I did see a lot of bikes left at certain locations or maybe they just weren't being used, right? Some other question, I don't think it's dealt with in the report, but I'm wondering if you observed um, any vandalization of the fleet that was provided and if so, if you tracked that in terms of like the amount of damage that was caused. Like, there are people out there who just like to vandalize. It's, it's a fact of our society. It's unfortunate, but, um, and that's a natural target. You know, they're really well made, they're attractive, right? So, um, staying in touch with Queens, I think is uh, important, as came up uh, in Councillor Question. And the AMS is the undergrad society, but there's also the SGPS, right? It's the Society of Graduate Professional Students. And they might be interested as well in doing an independent, uh, you know, a, a discussion. Um, don't forget about them, right? It's seven or eight thousand students there. Um, and going along with one of the questions that came up, or one of the points, um, I do see a very large potential um, at the Cat Town Center because that's a major transit hub. You've got your express routes all going there, or most of them, except the one that goes over to the East End. But you, it's, a, it's a widespread area that's covered, and there's not a lot of transit out in certain areas, right? So people could ride in from, say, Westbrook, for example. That's four or five kilometers from there. And, you know, use the bike back and forth each way, right? Uh, there's no transit. They don't have to own a car to live out there. So I'm glad that came up in terms of looking at how the transit hubs are going to, you know, uh, have synergy with the system. Um, so those are all my points. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Is, uh, staff has an opportunity to respond. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, just in the order that uh, Mr. Dixon, Dixon asked the questions, um, there, the, we did also observe bikes 
that have been knocked over or blown over at the different Haven locations. And that's something that the, uh, the BIA also commented to us on. And that is the reason why in the terms of reference in the report, we're looking for a system that, that has hard docks. So not smart docks, but actual um, a bicycle rack, if you will, um, so that so that the uh, the bikes have something to nest in and, and presumably would uh, would not fall over. Um, you asked about uh, uptake levels in other jurisdictions. That's that's something we do not have data data on. I think it's fair to say that other other cities are different, um, but we do see a, a general trend. Um, the, the growth in community bike share, especially in North America over the last um, 24 months has been really significant. Um, some of the experience in Asia with the, with the rapid um, appearance of dockless bikes has been a bit of a problem. Um, the capital investment that was put into those systems has been extreme and it's resulted in thousands and thousands of bikes in some jurisdictions in China, especially, and uh, not a lot of commitment to maintenance and organization. So that's been a, a problem for some municipalities, but that's that's pretty much the only negative story that I think I've, I've, I've heard in terms of community bike share. Um, you, uh, you also comment about bikes being locked to people's houses or, or, uh, or railings and so forth. There was a problem with the drop bike system. The first generation bikes had a mechanical lock on them. Those were, once you had the combination, you had it, you had it for good. Um, so you could basically keep that bike for as long as you wanted if the system didn't realize you had it. So if you, if you rented it one day and returned it that day, uh, you had the combination for that bike, you could come back the next day and take it without using the system and the drop bike people wouldn't know where it was. So I think a lot of that happened. Um, second generation drop bikes solved that. Uh, they used an electronic lock that you, could, you didn't know what the number was. Um, was vandalization tracked? Um, though that wasn't a metric that was reported back to the city, but drop bike did make uh, qualitative comments to us that they did experience vandalization and theft here in Kingston, but not to the same degree as, as their other systems in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, and of course, we agree that the Cat Town Center is is uh, maybe attractive to to proponents that are responding to this RFP, and they may they may see an opportunity to to place uh, community bike share there as well. Thank you. So we need a mover and a seconder for the recommendations. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Holland. Um, any comment? Yes, Councillor Neal. Just very quickly, you mentioned something after my questions earlier. Uh, you commented that there might be other opportunities to work in collaboration with, uh, with Kingston Transit. And I know, for instance, that Virtue Car gives a discount for membership if you have a, a Kingston Trans an active Kingston Transit pass. So something like that working collaboratively with, with uh, Kingston Transit, I think would be a very good thing. And I did have an opportunity to talk to uh, uh, the person who kind of managed it on behalf of Drop Bike over the summer. And he said the exact same thing. He said um, there was some vandalism, but it wasn't to the degree that it hurt their business model or they expected. It wasn't any, it, in fact, it was less than what they'd anticipated, so. We live in a good city, I guess that means. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else? I had one other thing I wanted to say. Um, regarding the accessibility questions, uh, and issues, both what's in the report and comments my colleagues have made. Um, I think if you study, if you look at this long enough, you realize that you're not, uh, you're not, the demographic that would use this type of service is not 
all of residents, obviously. So in, in the case of the pilot program, you saw uh, the university population, not even uh, at St. Lawrence College, right? It was just the Queen's University and then the downtown, uh, the downtown, the, if you look at the heat map, basically it, it tells us a pretty clear story of, of the usage. You can imagine if it's all main campus, the residences, city park, and then the Princess Street Corridor and City Hall are what's on the heat map. Uh, most, some of that would have been generated by where the bike started, of course, then they're more likely to end up there. But if you look at the smaller map where uh, it just includes just main campus, which is the bottom right map on exhibit A, the uh, physical education center is one of the big one at the top and then Botterill Hall is the big one at the bottom. And if you spend any time on campus, you'll know that you often see many bikes. In fact, I don't think any drop bikes started at Botterill Hall at all. Uh, I don't think they had a, a stand there, but uh, a week or two into the September, there was a half dozen at least. Every day I, on my way to hospital, I would see them there. Um, so these are bikes that have migrated over there because that's where they ended up. People took them to Butter Hall to do their studying or whatever, their go to class, and they, they sat there and probably someone else uh, took them from there and used them and they continued on. What the heat map doesn't show really is trajectories. And... Um, and because of this, I, 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 this concept that I, that I was mentioning earlier, that every bike has a beginning and an end. So you sign, it, sign in when you pick it up and you sign out. The nice thing about the drop bike app is that you didn't have to take the bike back to where you picked it up, which is the same if you have a dockable system. You can dock it in any dock that's open. You don't have to take it back to the same one. If you rent a car, which is a type of car sharing, I suppose you could say, you normally have to bring it back to the agency that you pick the car up from. If you don't, you pay an extra fee. With drop bike, that wasn't the case. However, we don't really know, we don't have statistics on that, of how, uh, like, what is the typical trajectory of these bikes? We just know the sort of end locations. Um, and of course, over time, it, it, it became further and further from the original starting points. It doesn't say how often the bike warriors we're relocating bikes to the to the uh, to the initial deployment points. My point is basically that if you're talking about integration with transit, the transit system looks at where people are going to trip generating, right? So their place of employment, place of residence, uh, other places you might go to on transit, community centers, places you go to activities, you know, arenas, places like that. With the, with the bikes, this was, this is a smaller area than the city. Now, yes, the Kingston is small enough that you could ride a bike to pretty much anywhere in Kingston. I do that, I ride a bike and I do that. I, I ride even to the West End. But the community bike share that we set up isn't likely to have a very high percentage of citywide use in a single trip. No matter where you're picking up the bike, you're probably get going a distance similar to what we see in this heat map or the original pilot program, with the distance from main campus to city hall, which is less than two kilometers, right? Uh, especially when you have a type of bike that only has one speed, it basically has a range and the the, the faster it goes or the easier it is to pedal, which different gears would make it easier to get higher speeds and therefore have a, a longer range, you don't get that with the, with the bikes that Drop Bike was deploying. One speed, sort of low end bikes, no problem if they get vandalized or stolen because they're cheap. However, you don't get very great range. So going to the north end from downtown on a Drop Bike, not very likely because of the kind of bike that was being deployed. Other communities are looking at different price points of infrastructure. The dock is one part of it, but there's also the bike itself. If any of you have ridden one of these drop bikes, you'll know what I'm talking about. The drop bike quality of unit was very low, also very cheap. So there's probably a reason for this particular one in a pilot program. If we wanna see a future 
It's not just whether there's docks or not. And if you're looking at deploying more expensive bikes, you will need docks because you will need a higher level of security. So that's where the cost curve starts go going up. There is a place in California that's talking about deploying electric bikes. Why? Same reason, because they have a much longer range. I ride an electric power assist bike now, and it's not because I'm lazy, it's because I can get to the Invista Center from downtown by bicycle, which I couldn't really do before. Not, not reliably, anyway. That's what the electric power assist does, it doubles your range. And conversely, if you have these one speed bottom end bikes, it reduces, your, probably cuts your range in half of, of the bikes that you're used to riding. So you ride a 10 speed, you get on a drop bike, you go half as far. So that's all part, I don't know how that's gonna be worded in the RFP, but the price point of the unit and maybe in these multiple ones and, and these things are changing, each community bike share program and each company that provides, they've been looking at this and it's been evolving. So hopefully we'll get to see that in the RFP responses, uh, a menu, uh, different options. Because I think if we go with the low end bikes again as a, as a permanent thing, it, it won't have very much longevity. People will use them a few times and then realize they can get a second hand bike for 100 bucks and go further. So, uh, just food for thought. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Councillor Neil. Just quickly, uh, I agree that people may not be taking long trips, uh, but having been a long time resident of Kingston, we don't want to be supporting any public service that looks like we're only serving Queens and the downtown. And the reality is, even if there aren't a lot of bikes at the Cat Center or North End Kingston, there will be people who take out a bike at the Cat Center to go to Walmart or to go to the Invista Center from there. And, and so I think whatever the system is, it's got a it has to look and try to be accessible across the city, so. Thank you. I guess uh, we're ready to vote on the recommendation. So I'll just read it out. That the EITP committee recommend account that council direct staff to issue an RFP for a community bike share provider based upon the terms of reference described within the report, and that the results of the RFP be brought to council along with any recommendations appropriate for the creation of a community bicycle sharing service, and that the EITP committee forward this report to council for inclusion on the agenda at their December 19th, 2017 meeting. That last clause is because we're only six days away from that meeting, or seven, I guess, but by the time we're done and we're within the deadline. Okay, uh, unless there's any further debate, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries, thank you. Next we have the briefing that goes along with the report under 8B, and that is Ms. Roberts, manager of solid waste, will speak to the committee regarding Waste Free Ontario Act proposed amended blue box program plan. And this briefing has been, um, is for, uh, to have a length of 15 minutes. Thank you, and thanks for the extra time tonight. I appreciate it. Um, so welcome, and thank you again for allowing me to speak on this subject. This is the third briefing that we've provided since the spring of 2016 regarding the Waste Free Ontario Act. The first about seven slides I'm gonna move through quite quickly because it is just a summary and a recap of the other briefings and reports that have come to this committee. The Waste Free Ontario Act, the goal of it is zero waste and to spark a circular economy and innovation in the province where waste is seen as a resource um, rather than just something that we bury in a landfill. And the spirit and the intent of the legislation is to remove cost and burden from taxpayers I have highlighted two of the points on this slide because they are important topics that I'm gonna to cover tonight. The transition of the waste diversion programs from the shared responsibility to a full extended producer responsibility regime and that there's no prescribed role for municipalities but we could play a role as a service provider. 
you may have remembered this flowchart from a previous presentation, but this just sets out um, how the legislation flows down. So it's the Waste Free Ontario Act. There are two acts and a strategy that are included. And I've highlighted tonight that we are stuck in the Waste Diversion Transition Act. So we have yet to move over to the Resource Recovery and Circular Economy Act. Um, and the, the, the Waste Diversion Transition Act is really just a key piece of the legislation which is gonna enable us to get to where we are today to the new legislation. And the strategy is a plain language, somewhat plain language um, document which sets the roadmap of how we're gonna achieve, uh, achieve all of the vision of the Waste Free Ontario Act. Our current state, as I said, we are in the Waste Diversion Transition Act right now, and we are wrapping up the current waste diversion programs. It's a key piece of legislation which is gonna get us from a shared responsibility regime to a full extended producer responsibility regime. And it's the mechanism right now that's being used to amend the current Blue Box program plan and trying to amend it earlier than planned so that we can um, hopefully start to recover more, more dollars for our blue box programs. Under this current plan, we get 50% of our costs covered. And an interesting stat there that um, with the help of AMO has been pulled together that every year that we prolong the transition of where we are today to a full extended producer responsibility, it's costing municipalities in Ontario $130 million and I've just included that equates to about 1.7 for Kingston. The Resource Productivity and Recovery Authority is the new Waste Diversion Ontario. They are overseeing the wrap up of the current diversion programs. Um, they're approving wind up plans and the wind up of the industry funding organizations. And they are also the ones that will approve an amended blue box program plan before it is submitted to the minister. So the blue box program plan that exists today was started in 2002 and its intent was to make sure that the producers of that packaging in Ontario understand that they are to fund 50% of municipalities blue box program costs um, and there were targets set in there. Um, it hasn't been working. We've been stuck at low diversion rates for the entire province, thus um, the push to have new legislation in the province. A request for an amended blue box program plan. So the strategy originally set out that the blue box program plan would likely to transition in 2020, sorry, 2022 or 2023. Um, but as I showed a stat earlier, every year that we prolong that, Ontario municipalities lose $130 million and Kingston loses 1.7 million. Um, so AMO has been working on this file extensively um, and a new coalition was formed, which is the M3RC. Um, and together with Stewardship Ontario, they agreed to send a letter known as the Accord in the waste industry, um, requesting the minister to send a request to the Resource Productivity and Recovery Authority that they wind up the blue box program plan earlier or ask for transition. So instead of waiting until later, let's try and do something now. Let's take an intern step now to try to move from a shared responsibility regime to a full extended producer responsibility regime. Um, in August, the minister received that letter and also issued his own letter asking and requesting RIPRA and Stewardship Ontario to consult with municipalities and other stakeholders and figure out a way to put together an amended blue box program plan and he asked that that be submitted to him in Febu on February 15th. So what is that a, a proposed amended blue box program plan? So I'm not gonna be able to cover everything tonight. Um, I'm gonna go through this quickly but there's a lot of information in the staff report as well. A municipality could, could choose to transition under this amended blue box program plan um, but if we do not choose to, we would continue to receive our 50% funding, which is in place right now. Um, and we would continue to get that until the Resource Recovery and Circular Economy Act takes full effect. Under transition, we would have, um, we would have the first right to choose to be a service provider to provide collection in our community. So picking up blue boxes and gray boxes as we do today, um, but we will not have the first choice 
to provide post-collection services. And post-collection services is defined as really everything that we do at the MRF. Everything we do at the Material Recovery Facility in Kingston right now, we may not have the choice later on to do that. SO is saying that they would be, Stewardship Ontario is SO, by the way, um, would be responsible for some promotion and education, but might ask the city to help them with that. They'll cover within reason admin costs. Presumably, though, the intent is that 100% of the costs would be covered for your Blue Box program. Of course, they're going to want us to enter into a contract with them and tell us how they want things done. So that, that's, a, that's a risk to the, the city as well. And they have to reach a 75% diversion goal. So that's quite higher than what the current Blue Box program plan is, set at 60%. And PPP is printed paper and packaging. So collection. If we chose to transition, the city would, we would have a choice to play a middleman. So on one side, we would have a contract with Stewardship Ontario. They would tell us all the things that they want us to do to collect their obligated blue box materials. And then we would go out and get a contractor, um, such like we do today for parts of the city, and we, um, we would have a contract with them. So essentially we end up playing a middleman. We would have to abide by Stewardship Ontario's terms and conditions. They'd have certain contamination levels subject to penalties. And they would likely also tell us in that contract where we must deliver those materials for post-collection services. Alternatively, we could indicate that we do not wish to be a service provider. And in that case, they would hire and they would figure out how they are going to collect their materials, which would be much different and we would have little control over how our customers are going to be serviced. Um, the province, of course, is saying that it has to still be convenient and there should be no disruption to Ontario ends. Um, so you would presume that the service would stay likely the same, but there would be no guarantee for us. So it, it could pose a big risk for our residents. If your box doesn't get collected, you call the city, we would take care of it right now, but if we choose to opt out of being a, a service provider for collection, we would be telling them to call somebody else to figure out the, the problem. Post-collection, as I mentioned before, municipalities will not have first right to act as a post-collection provider. Right now, the in the consultation that Stewardship Ontario has provided, they're saying that they will be using a request for a request for expression of interest, followed by an RFP process to set up a post-collection network in the province. And the city's MRF may or may not play a role in that. Um, even if the city chooses to provide collection, we still may not have a role in the post-collection network. And they might be telling us where we're sending our recyclables. Um, to PACE transition, Stewardship Ontario right now is suggesting that they would break the province up into catchment areas. Each catchment area in the province would have a designated year when the municipalities could choose to transition or not. The likely catch and catchment go dates will be from 2020 to 2025. Um, Stewardship Ontario would like to transition both sides of the program, collection and post-collection, at the same time. Um, I'll just move into this um, flow chart here. Okay, good, it's legible. Um, so on the one side, you've got um, Stewardship Ontario assessment and consultation. So they're suggesting that if the minister approves the plan, they would look at the geographic regions in the province, they would identify evident catchment areas and establish when those catchment areas will be eligible to transition. And then that will be up to the municipalities to decide whether or not they want to transition. And it will mostly, largely, what will enable that transition is what your contract status is like for current collection and post-collection services. So where are we today? This is the timeline for the amended Blue Box Program Plan. I just want to clarify that all the information that I'm providing here today has been provided to, to the City of Kingston and all other municipalities in consultation from Stewardship Ontario. So none of this has actually been approved by the Minister. This is what Stewardship Ontario has consulted with stakeholders on, saying this is likely what's going to be included in our, in our plan that we're submitting to be approved by the Minister. So I've highlighted here 
um, where we are today. And so conveniently, um, Stewardship Ontario has decided to release the draft proposal on December 22nd because we like to do a lot of reading over the holiday. Um, and then um, into the new year, there will be um, some webinar to review what was actually in their amended Blue Box program proposal, get some more feedback, then Stewardship Ontario needs to submit that plan to the Resource Productivity and Recovery Authority. Um, and if they approve it, then it will go to the minister on February 15th. And then there's a whole other scale after that of the things that he'll have to do. First step will be that that report or that proposal will have to go on um, the EBR for comments. So full public consultation on what it says. Um, and then it will be approved um, later on or it won't be approved. So what do we need to do as the city of Kingston? We need to continue to provide the services as we do today. The earliest possible date that any municipality would be able to transition, but we're gonna have to wait until our catchment date is revealed after the minister approves the plan is gonna be 2020 or 2025. So we've got a little bit of time still to be watching this legislation and making plans. Um, wait to review the draft amended blue box program plan before we bring forth any more recommendations to this committee. Um, continuing to consult, continue with consulting services to complete our procurement options analysis and final business plan for the city's MRF, which is gonna assist us later on with the decision making process. And the solid waste transition plan that identifies those key imperatives that we're gonna need to undertake to align with the amended blue box program plan and any other items that are in that legislation. And right now our recommendation is that we would stagger some of those recommendations in Q1 and Q2 of 2018 as we receive more information on, the, on both the amended blue box program plan and other parts of that legislation. Thank you. Okay, so questions from members of the committee. Councillor Neal. Yes, um, I know 50% is the target, but very few, correct me if I'm wrong, but very few municipalities actually ever get the full 50% under the current program. Is that accurate, an accurate statement? That is accurate, and so the data that we submit, um, there's a best practice section of that. Um, and so municipalities have to be doing certain key strategies and trying to be the best that they can be. It's not all just based on cost. Um, and to date, Kingston, somewhere since 2002, when we first started to get um, funding, were somewhere between 42 and 47% of that funding. Thank you. Um, if we were to maintain collection, as a municipal service, but we were able to buy into the, the proposed program. Will that actually, I'm thinking somebody else will be doing the marketing of the materials, somebody else will, will do the collection, but somebody else uh, will take care of those headaches that you have to find market for for the goods after we separate it, and will it be pure, we'll do the collection, somebody else will do the separation and the marketing. Is that accurate? I think it's too early to say that for certain, but it could be that. So we'll have first right to choose whether or not we wanna do collection. We will not have first right to choose if we wanna do MRF processing or, or marketing of the materials yeah. um, because Stewardship Ontario has said that they intend to do a request for expression of interest followed by an RFP as they set up those catchment areas. And so we, it's detailed in my report that, you know, we could respond to that REOI as the city of Kingston and say what we can do, but ultimately under this legislation, the province has given the producers the flexibility to choose how they're gonna meet their targets. And they'll be the ones that get to decide how they wanna meet that goal of recovering 75% of the PPP. Um, so we may or we, we may not. And again, it's always a frustration I know when we're trying to hit those higher targets as a community 
that the ICI sector operates in a far less uh, stringent way to try and achieve improved. Um, does it look like the ministry is going to uh, demand more of the ICIs? Um, through your chair, it, it does. Um, the ministry, we voiced our frustration as municipalities that we have been complying and operating very well, and in fact, most of us have very high diversion rates, but provincially, when you mix residential and ICI together, we're stuck in the low teens. Um, so we're not really the problem area, but we seem to be always the first one that they want to tackle and reach out to. But yes, they have said that they intend on revising their 3R regulation and putting more stringent controls on the IC and I sector to ensure that they're diverting more of their waste. We're waiting patiently. Thank you. Questions only, anyone else? Councillor Hutchison. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there seems to be a rather restricted number of options that will be open to the municipality. So I'm just wondering how staff feels about that. Like, do you think we should be doing the collection? Um, sometimes I think yes, sometimes I'm not quite sure what you're thinking, maybe I'm not sure. And um, just because, you know, we've been listening to this for what, three years at least, right? So, <clears throat> and a little bit more is there to be told each time, but nothing really definitive. So I'm just wondering, I mean, I, as you said earlier that you're, con I think you were saying that you're concerned about, you know, customer service and what the standard would be. And for that reason, I sort of derived that you really wouldn't want to let go of that because you're apprehensive about how the system would go if it was left in the hands of the producers entirely. Is that fair to say? And the second thing is, do you think it's best for the municipality to continue collecting the collection service? So uh, I think it's still too early to tell for certain. I think I've highlighted the risk that if we chose to be a service provider for collection, um, that we would have more control over the service level that we're providing to our customer. There would be more accountability for the customer to rely on the municipality providing that service. Whereas if we decided that we don't wanna be a service provider, we're leaving that service in the hands of the producers and we have no idea what that looks like. And you know we're still the ones that are coming around picking up garbage in green bin. So that disconnect for the customer of deciding, okay, if my garbage isn't picked up on my, on my green bin, I call one number, but if I have an issue with my blue box or my gray box, I have to call another number. And I think that that would create a lot of frustration. And so it's still too early because I, I want to have more details on what perhaps a contract would look like between a municipality and Stewardship Ontario for the city to become a service provider. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that if we chose to be a service provider at the time of transition that we have to always be a service provider. So you might be a service provider for seven years. And I, I say seven years because that's a typical length of a contract for recycling collection. That's usually when your trucks mature and you have replacement. Um, so during that time, if there were other municipalities that chose not to be a service provider or a middleman, we could learn from their lessons and decide at that time if, okay, is now the right time for Kingston to not provide this, the recycling service because the producers are providing a superior service. So this did happen out in British Columbia. Um, and the city of Vancouver chose not to allow the producers to take over the collection. Um, and they held back for two or three years. And what they learned in that time was that um, they were providing a, a comparable service and they decided to um, allow the producers to, to take over and deliver the collection service for them out there. 
Um, the programs are very different, though, between Ontario and, and British Columbia. A, a lot of nuances that I, I'm not going to get into tonight, but it doesn't mean it's forever if we chose to be a service provider um, at the time of this first start of transition. I guess that provokes the, the, the situation in, in Toronto when they privatized half the city, and it doesn't seem to have really done anything. Like, it certainly doesn't cost less, mm -hmm. the private service. And I don't think the service is any better, and maybe worse in some ways, which was, in my view, kind of predictable. But um, as it's been found out in the States in different places, so do you think it would look like that? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I think we, we need to understand more and our plan is to come back with more recommendations on those items in 2018. Any other questions from councillors? Yeah, to do the briefing, yeah. I have a question about catchment areas. It doesn't, you didn't say, and, and it's because it hasn't been said, but early on in the process, they will look at evident catchment areas. Knowing the geography of Kingston and how we are not close to any other large urban areas, and we are, for example, I work at the regional hospital, which is the only level three regional hospital between the GTA and Ottawa, uh, and therefore our sort of catchment area for the hospital is the, is the whole Eastern Ontario region minus Ottawa. Um, I'm wondering if we can predict what the catchment area would look like for Kingston. Uh, to some extent, yes. The producers did um, a blue box optimization study in 2012. So they commissioned that study because they wanted to understand how waste was moving throughout um, different regional areas of the province. And I believe the province was split into five or six areas. So there's no guarantee that they're gonna use those again, but we know that they have that data. Um, it's really old at this point though, people's waste, people's recycling could be going elsewhere. Um, but we do feel like there's it's probably going to be Eastern Ontario, um, but I don't know where the dividing lines are going to be. The, the previous catchment area was, I think the cutoff was um, Quinty West, and then it was everything east of that was considered Eastern Ontario, probably up until included all of Renfrew County and, and stopped there. Including the city of Ottawa? Including the city yeah. of Ottawa. So, so we could say that perhaps we will be in the same catchment area as the city of Ottawa. I would assume that we are going to be in the same catchment area as the city of Ottawa, yes. Yeah. I guess that's my only question for now. Thank you. So now members of the public have a chance to comment or ask questions about the briefing. Sorry, not about the briefing, about the information report, about the report that was available to the public. It's all related, of course. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the report and the briefing. Really very informative. Um, learned a lot from this. Um, and this really has just kind of one, one question, sort of maybe in different parts. Um, right now, we're into a period of NAFTA renegotiation, right? Canada, U.S., and Mexico have had trade agreements in place since the 90s, and they're being um, looked at in detail. We get a lot of reports on this in the media. And this might be something that may come under a new NAFTA. Um, I don't know where the NAFTA um, treaty says on this now. I haven't really looked into that. But I think that's significant because Leadership in Kingston should be aware of that. It's ongoing, and I think it should be tracked. And just going along with this point, um, where does Ontario stand with respect to other provinces in Canada? Like, are we in the lead, or are we in the middle, or are we trailing? 
and then say American states, and then maybe further on down the road, sort of European nations. I mean, we can learn from lessons that have been learned elsewhere um, earlier. So I'd appreciate knowing something about that. And I'm just wondering, like, um, which American state and or Canadian province is the furthest advanced in this? Is it British Columbia and Canada, or we're talking Vermont or New Hampshire or Massachusetts or something like that? Because I'd like, I'd just like, like to know that. Um, so we can look at what they are doing. Um, we've got a Washington administration, which is um, unusual. It's um, oscillating daily on where it seems to be going. And we've got a evolution okay. denier and a climate change in, uh, denier yeah. in the White House. So I'm, I'm just yes, we, trying we, to stick to what's in the yeah. report, Mr. Dixon. Sure, okay, so I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. Um, sorry about that. Um, just in terms of maybe like a wider perspective on where we stand, um, because we're putting a lot of good thinking into this, right? I'm really impressed at the detailed sophistication of the presentation. So, um, just like to know sort of where we're going and where we're going to stand. I think you're aware of that, but just in that context. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, staff has an opportunity to make comment. At Bear in mind, the committee does not demand that you respond to things that are not in the report. Go ahead. So um, the, uh, the response um, to the questions about NAFTA and, and the U.S. in comparison with other states, unfortunately, we can't uh, respond to that. I think as Ms. Roberts pointed out, um, the work that we are doing, or I guess I should say she is doing, the report tonight really is being driven by the province of Ontario, um, trying to, to move forward on this, and we will continue to, uh, to monitor that. Um, I, I think it's always good to be aware of what's going on in the world around us, but uh, in all honesty, we have not, we have not looked at that. I, I think, we're, <laughs> as indicated, we're trying to stay abreast of what's happening in Ontario, and that, that's a bit of a challenge at the moment. Thank you. Maybe I'll just take this quick moment to thank um, staff for uh, its part in the uh, reality that was recently announced that we reached the diversion target of 60%. Um, I don't know if maybe, I should have asked this before, but maybe you could just sort of uh, give us that announcement in context of, uh, of, of where, um, what that sort of th threshold means and where uh, we're headed sort of individually on waste diversion rates and how that relates to what the province is doing. Thanks, so through you, your chair. Um, we did, we reached a 60% waste diversion from landfill for 2015. Um, unfortunately, the data that we submit to the province, it takes them quite a while to go through that because they have to assess all municipalities and do the calculations for all municipalities and compare each other. Um, so we're third in the province with a 60.9%, so almost 1%, which is amazing. And um, I'm so proud of the community and proud of my staff. And we're doing some celebrations at the end of the year and hope to continue that celebration and include um, council and other members of the public in the new year. So we are third in the province, so I can't specify or um, I guess compare to other jurisdictions outside of Ontario. Uh, I think that that's excellent. The province has a goal of 60% or 65% waste aversion for the entire province and they're nowhere near achieving that. The, the latest waste aversion rate for the entire province I think is 16%, which includes residential and IC and i So when you look at the waste that the city controls and has under its management, reaching a 60% waste aversion rate is excellent. And I, I, I don't have any doubts that our 2016 waste aversion rate will be the same or better. Thank you. Thank you to the member of the public who uh, felt necessary to break the rules of conduct. Uh, it, is, it is quite exciting though, and, and uh, thank you for what you're doing, and it's nice to know that we're third in the province. Now, that was an information report, but comment, uh, further comment is, is allowed at this point. Uh, Councillor Hutchison. Well, I do think that's pretty wonderful. The, we passed a motion, I think it was Councillor Neal's motion, 
um, can't remember exactly when in the last year or two, about setting a, um, a parameter, a criteria for increasing our waste diversion. And I'm just wondering where the 60, 61% leaves us in regard to that. I can't remember the, 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 the goal, but it was 65 maybe, I can't remember 63, but if you know that, I'd like to be reminded of where, where, where we're headed, where we're trying to be headed in relative to today. Through you, your chair. Um, our goal is to have a 60% waste diversion rate by 2018. So the goal was set for the end of term for this council. And our longer range goal is 65%. My recommendation right now is I'd like to see that 60% stabilized, um, ensuring that th some of the data that goes into that, that we don't move ahead too quickly to set a 65% if something changes with the way that the calculations are done by the province. Thank you. So we are, according to our own numbers, past the target that we set based on our revised target for 2018. That was the, the motion by Councillor Neal you're talking about. It was at this committee and it was to specifically align it with the term of council. So we're at that already in 2017. So great job. Yes, Councillor Osanek. Thank you. Which were the two cities that were just ahead of us? <laughs> I, I don't, I want to do an email update to my district, so this would save me looking it up. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Roberts. Through you, your chair. Um, Aurelia and York, I believe. But let me confirm that, but I believe it's those two cities. Any other comments on the report? Seeing none, thank you very much. I keep up the good work. Our last item of business is the very exciting Double the Tree Canopy initiative update. And it looks like Mr. Wells will introduce this report. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the report before you is, is intended to update you on the Double the Tree Canopy Initiative. There was a requirement that we bring in an update back to this committee. And uh, we, we've done that and we've included uh, in it as a reference some of the other major uh, forestry related programs that we have underway and have had underway for some time. They all sort of fit together and, and they all in one way or another support the urban forest management plan that we developed quite some time ago back uh, I think around 2011. The other thing we've included in this report is um, there was a, a suggestion brought forward to us by uh, two of the councillors here tonight that er, earlier this year that we uh, undertake to uh, do an assessment of our uh, young uh, recently planted trees and uh, we, we did that assessment this, uh, this past season and it, we're presenting those uh, findings at the end of this report as well. So it's kind of killing two birds with one stone, but uh, I think it's all a good news story. Uh, it, most of the detail is, is in the report and uh, I'll leave it to you for uh, to bring forward questions if you have any on that report. Thank you. Just quickly, Mr. Wells, that last item of the young trees, is that the table B on page eight of the report? Yes, that's correct. With the correct. planting year 2015, 2016, 2017? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Okay, yes. so that's the condition report of the young trees. Are there any questions from members of the committee? <laughs> Councilor Senek must have at least one question. <laughs> Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much for this report and for doing the assessment of the young trees for the last three years. Um, so on page nine, where you talk about um, Taylor Kid near the Valley Land plantings, is that Taylor Kid and Centennial Drive along the railway tracks? So between Centennial Drive and Princess Street? Yeah, that's correct. Just sort of opposite uh, Wellington Village there. Or that subdivision there. 
And is there any chance of planting trees along the north side of Taylor Kid there? Because Taylor Kid doesn't have plans to go to four lanes, right? Or that would be six lanes. Right now it's two lanes on either side. So um, when you look at the north side of Taylor Kid from um, <laughs> Princess Street, basically all the way through to um, Gardner's Road, there's no trees at all along there. And it would just be nice to plant trees, you know, just for the aesthetic appearance of Taylor Kid along there. So I know all the plantings in 2013 were done on the south side, so I'm just wondering if we could do some street trees along the north side. Through you, Mr. Chair. With the, the um, desire to meet the, the double the tree canopy goal by 2025, we look, we're looking at the the entire length of Taylor Kid, both sides, um, and looking out or looking for appropriate places that we could plant trees. We would have to do that in conjunction and uh, consultation with uh, engineering to make sure that uh, none of the trees that we're, we intend to plant are going to impact the, uh, the traveled uh, uh, lanes through there and want to make sure we don't create any visibility, obstructions, or anything like that. But a short answer to your question, we're going to look at the entire length of Taylor Kid for opportunities to plant trees both north and south sides. Thank you. Um, a second question I have is about Table B. So for the dead trees, um, how did they get replanted then? Like, how does, how does that work? Um, do we replant, like, if a tree is assessed dead in the year of 2017, does it get replanted by the fall of 2017 or 2018? Like, are we definitely making sure that all the trees that don't survive are being replaced? Through you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. We're, we will be replanting those dead trees. They didn't make the fall uh, 2017 planting program because we by the time we had the assessment done, we'd already completed the planning for the 2017 fall planting, but they will be planted either in the spring or the fall of the 2018 year. Okay, thank you. And then does that mean that the ones that were dead from the 2016 planting will also be replanted, like replaced in 2018? Yes, yeah, so the assessments we did were for... Uh, the years 2015, 2016, and 2017. So any of those that, that we found that were in, that had expired in those three years, they will be replanted. We also had a, a small percentage uh, that um, were in poor condition. So we will reassess those uh, poor condition trees to make sure they continue to survive. And if they don't, they will be replanted as well. Okay, thanks, because there's definitely dead trees along the stormwater management pond of Cataraqui Woods Drive. I've sent Mark Campbell many emails about that. And so that brings to my next question. So for the trees, like in these numbers and everything, um, where are the trees that have been planted in new subdivisions, such as Woodhaven, right, which is Cataraqui West? So for the trees along Catwoods Drive, that are dead, are they factored into these numbers or is that independent because they were planted by developers and they have like two year warranty under developers to replace, like how does that all work? Because those are the trees that I see, right? When you're driving around, those are the trees that are highly visible. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the answer to most of your questions is yes. Um, Basically, the trees that we assessed were trees that were planted under our authority. So we didn't we we didn't assess trees in um, planted as part of the development. Um, as you stated, most of those are under a two-year warranty, and when that warranty expires, our tree inspector goes in and does a an assessment of those plantings for each individual development. And at that time, we will consider when we, if we find trees there that um, are dead, then 
beyond, and it's beyond the uh, warranty period, we will work them into our replanting plans for either the spring or fall planting, but typically for the fall planting. So once that warranty period is over and those trees become our responsibility, then we assess them and, and uh, replant them as may be required. Thank you. And just two more points, right? I think um, like as we go into the future, and I don't know if it would be this council, since this council comes to an end in 2018, or if it would have to be the next council, but I do think we have to go into like GIS mapping so that we can see where the trees are being replanted, especially in light of the Emerald ash borer, and we're, you know, cutting down so many trees, and where are the replacement trees going? I think we might have to throw money into GIS mapping if our own internal staff can't do it as part of it. Um, but I do think it's important just so, like for those trees on Bath Road, for instance, at um, Centennial Drive, south side, up to the creek that were dead for so many years and then, you know, the, they were replaced just to keep track of what's happening and for the public to know where the replacement trees are going. So I think that's something that council has to direct for the future. To you, Mr. Chair, um, we're working towards that uh, GIS mapping. We do have uh, the inventory from uh, 2013, I believe, that identified the uh, ash trees that became part of the Emerald Ash Borer Program. But when we had that inventory done, we, we had it done for all um, of the uh, municipally owned street and park trees in the urban area. So we have a lot of that information already, but there's still a lot um, of, say, the development planted trees and, and some of the other trees that have been planted by their departments that we haven't got all included in that, that, uh, that uh, mapping yet, but it's, it's a work in progress. And through you, Mr. Chair, my last um, question is, um, where you say that it's hard to find um, trees, uh, hard to find spots to plant trees, right? Um, and like we're trying to think of where we're gonna plant all of the 2018 trees. I think there's like 1,500, I think the report said, a um, 1,000 of which will be new plantings in the fall because 500 will be planted in the spring. Um, I would like to see if we could get public input. So for instance, I had a resident last year who asked if um, some street trees could be planted in Highgate Creek, um, Highgate Drive, right? Which is an established area, subdivisions 40 years old. And I think staff were going to try to plant a couple of trees this past fall, right? In response to that residence. So maybe, Maybe maybe some residents have ideas where we could try to plant trees, and of course then staff can assess to see if that's actually possible. But um, I think we should, you know, through the communications department, do an email out and you know have an email address where people could recommend where trees could go, because that might be an area that we, you know, there's only so many staff, there's 125,000 residents. Maybe some of those residents have an idea that we haven't thought of. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, absolutely, we're we're, uh, we're more than happy to uh, receive suggestions for where trees might be able to be planted. Um, all those locations need to be assessed for underground and overhead uh, utilities. And um, when we spoke to uh, some of the challenges we have with finding locations. Um, there are some places where there's a suitable location to plant a tree, but the adjacent property owner uh, doesn't necessarily want it there. So, and then one, one of the things we have found um, recently is um, in some of the park plantings that we've proposed, there has been a concern that we're using up too much of the open space. So we have to, we have to balance that open space uh, need with uh, planting trees as well. So it, it takes a lot of legwork to to find those locations and verify that they're a good spot to, to plant, and then decide which, what type of tree is best suited for that location. So one of the other things we've found is, is to sort of to ensure the survivability is, is to put the right 
type of tree in the right conditions and in the right soil and, and whatnot. So there's a lot of work that has to go into planning the planting programs and often it's, it's hard to um, get the staff time to find enough locations to, to meet the demand that we're, or the uh, numbers of trees that we're proposing to plant. So, but absolutely, um, we welcome uh, input from the public and, and uh, we get there to assess it as, as soon as we could, depending on the program we have. Thanks. Well, I was happy to see that Woodbine Park um, is one candidate for new trees and McCullough Park, right, because those are both in my district. And definitely with Woodbine Park, um, I often get the complaint there's not enough shade. You know, if they're having a soccer summer camp, for example, and it's really hot, like two summers ago, there's nowhere shady for them to go in the break time. And uh, just as a comparison, um, that I dug up a couple of weeks ago. So for Ottawa, they're planting in 2018 in their budget 125,000 trees. So when I saw our 18,000 trees over the last two years, I thought that was a great number. <laughs> and it is a good number, so 9,000 trees a year. But if Ottawa is 10 times our size, then that is 90,000 trees equivalent to 125,000 trees. Um, Ottawa is trying to live up to that, I don't know, that 1 billion tree I don't know, the, the UNESCO, United Nations Challenge, so they put a and because of the emerald ash borer. So, uh, yeah, we definitely have to still keep up with the tree planting that we're doing, but thanks very much. Councillor Neal. Yes, a couple of things. I want to thank uh, Public Works. I know that uh, uh, in both the OP and in the Williamsville Corridor study, we have some green streets. Um, Alfred, Frontenac, Albert, and I believe maybe Nelson as well have been identified and I've noticed several trees have been planted along uh, Alfred most recently and I really appreciate that. Um, the other thing is I noted that the it wasn't just city staff that were doing the planting, It's it was a contractor and I know for us to be able to meet our very ambitious goals, it's beyond the capacity of, of just our own staff to do the planting. So uh, I, I appreciate that. In the parks, uh, you mentioned, and you'll never get a complaint out of me about planting too many trees in a park, but uh, both Memorial Center, Victoria Park, and I think Second Avenue, um, had some tree plantings um, done by contractors as well as those trees along Alfred Street. Are you, um, I know in the past there's been some problems with just outside of warranty, trees dying. Um, are we able to do inspections in a really timely way so that we can get those contractors uh, on their dime to replace trees that may be stressed or or don't su succeed? Through you, Mr. Chair. So you're very correct. We, our forestry group is just, we don't have the capacity to plant that number of trees. So we, we for our spring and, and fall planting programs, they're typically done by a contracted service. We put out a, an RFP. And we've um, tightened up on that RFP um, every time it's, it's gone out. We, different things come to light, so we add in more things to make sure that uh, the contractor does it properly. But the trees, once planted, they're ours, so there isn't, there isn't a warranty on them like there is for the development trees. It's, it's our responsibility to make sure that the contractor plants them properly. And... Um, and then we, we look after them from there. And uh, I think if you look at the, the survival rate that, that we saw in our, our uh, assessment of those young trees over the, planted over the, over the last uh, three years at 94%, that's a, that's a significant uh, number. Uh, so that tells us that um, several things. It tells us that uh, we're, we're doing a good job with our contractors to make sure they're planted correctly. 
Uh, it tells us that um, the uh, tree watering program that we initiated in 2016 uh, was successful. Uh, we put a lot of effort into watering those young trees and, and uh, it's reflected in that 95% or 94% survival rate. So I think, so having said that, um, before this wet and rainy year that we had, we had <coughs> uh, developed a, a tree watering program uh, mapped out where the newly planted trees were and we were all set to go if it was required. So uh, we've decided that on an annual basis as we plant, continue to plant more trees, we will change that tree watering program to, to meet that, those three year tree criteria and make sure that each spring we, we have that program ready to go. One of the other things we're doing is because we're, we're extending t into doing more spring plantings um, and that's again uh, a capacity issue is to try to spread out the, the planting process so that we can find the sites and, and get the plantings in. When we look at, uh, when you, one of the issues with planting in the spring is if you get a hot, dry summer, then, then you've got those trees there that, that don't get enough water. So what we're looking at adding to our uh, sp spring planting uh, contract requirement is uh, for um, a period of watering those trees initially by the contractor. So that will add some cost to our, our RFP, but we feel it's it's essential to help those young trees grow. So, as their as our urban forest is growing, our uh, abilities and our our plans for planting and and how we manage that is is growing as well. And we're learning each year. And um, I think all in all, um, the staff have done a, an excellent job in in uh, doing what was required and in, in getting us to that 95 or 94 percent survival rate. Thank you. And um, I've had two very, I have to say, odd constituency complaints. Uh, the complaints were odd, not the constituent. But uh, the, uh, the one complained about a tree being planted on their property. And clearly it was on the city boulevard. Uh, the other complaint was uh, they planted a tree and the city came around and said it was an inappropriate tree and they'd have to take it down. Is it possible for us to do some kind of greater public awareness of the fact that ev everybody's front lawn, even if they cut it for 20 years, isn't their, necessarily their property? We also get complaints when a sign pole gets put, put up for a parking signage that's necessary and people inevitably think it's being done on their property why is the city doing this nobody consulted us what kind of consultation do we do around those things uh, through you your uh, mr chair um good good question we actually when our planting programs get underway prior to that, we do um, uh, social media feeds, uh, we do Twitter feeds, and, and when we go into an area to start planting, or if we're going into an area to start removals, we do uh, door hangers on every house that's, that uh, either is gonna have a, uh, a tree adjacent to their yard or, or in the general neighborhood we do a, a blanket cover there. I have one in here somewhere, dig it out. And um, there it is. And on that door hanger, there's a, a lot of information. Uh, we speak about how the trees work hard for us. Um, we tell people when, sort of generally, when we'll be coming, we'll be coming soon. And these door hangers go on uh, several weeks before we actually get there to start to plant the trees. Um, we also put uh, some information on the back for residents who care to do so for, for caring for uh, newly planted trees. Um, if you remember also uh, a few years back, we developed a uh, tree watering alert program for those short period droughts where we would put out alerts and, and people can put 
five gallons of water on their tree once a week and uh, just to help it survive through those dry periods. So all of that kind of information is on there and also our contact information if, if they have questions about uh, the tree that's going to be in front of their yard or this is, and from these tree hang, these uh, door hangers, these are been some of the, uh, resulted in some of the re requests for not to have a tree in that location. And um, to be honest, we, although it's a challenge to find places, we do try to accommodate the residents' request and not put a tree there if, if they absolutely don't want it. Um, chances are if we put it there, it might not survive anyway, despite our best efforts if they don't really want it there. So we try to work with the public and, and put them where they would like. When we're planting uh, thousands of trees, there are going to be instances where um, there will be, there will be uh, disagreements about where the property line is. Um, we get those even when we're pruning trees or, or doing maintenance. Um, so it's it, to have a couple of questions like that is, is not uncommon, but uh, staff will go to each one and, and explain the situation to the residents. Um, our forestry staff are, are very adept at that. Um, so. If any of those come, those questions come forward to you, by all means, please uh, forward to them to us, and we can we can go back and talk to the resident again if needs be. Thank you. Oh, the last comment. Um, if are are we likely to be more successful hitting our goal if we're able to uh, put forward some more capital dollars towards tree planting? Uh, so that it isn't, I, I mean, can we, with the current capital budgets and your operating budget, come close to achieving our very ambitious goals? Through you, Mr. Chair. So in the, in the information report, we speak about the uh, Silver Maple program that we have for the aged street trees that we have. And we talk about the Emerald Ash Borer program, which is a a very significant undertaking for us and some of the other th things that we're doing in the forestry sector. So with the Emerald Ash Borer program, it, to be honest, it has taken up a lot of our capacity to, uh, of our staff capacity to manage that, those removals. And we've been sort of, um, we're, we're as, as you'll see in the report, our, our numbers going forward for planting for the double the tree canopy are going to increase. So we feel that, that we have uh, sufficient capital funds for at least 2018. But when we get into 2019, then the Emerald Ash Borer program is starting to, to taper off. And we'll be uh, putting more of our staff effort into the double the tree canopy issue. So for 2019 and and going forward for that next four-year capital program, we will be coming back with a capital request for additional capital funds for planting more trees in those uh, subsequent years. And that will probably continue through to uh, 2025. And hopefully some of us will be here to support that budget. Thank you. Councillor Shell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first question, all, all the trees we're planting are going on city-owned land. Is that correct? To you, Mr. Chair, that's correct, yes. Thanks. Um, there was a, a really good article on the radio recently calling um, urban trees uh, the street kids of the tree world because we're planting them, we're telling them where to grow. There's nothing natural about it. We try to create a natural environment so that they can grow, but really, they didn't drop an acorn and come up. We've, we've told them what to do and you know where to be, so it's a little tougher for them. Um, this is sort of, well, the, the next question is, um, as we're increasing the urban canopy, does your budget, and I'm not even sure how you could work this, include the maintenance? Um, because of course, every large tree that the city owns, if there's any kind of damage or, um, problems, you know, you'll have to factor in taking care of them. And the maintenance of streets as we have more and more trees and then the massive number of leaves that drop and they, you know, foul up the uh, storm drains. 
every fall. Um, do you factor in that kind of thing that, that you'll need an actual bit of an increase in maintenance budgets just because of the added uh, stress for maintenance of trees? Through you, Mr. Chair. As of yet, we haven't. Uh, we know that that's, that's coming. Um, right now, the, the majority of the trees that we planted aren't even the larger caliper, caliper trees that we planted. They, they aren't having a significant impact as of yet. However, um, on a go forward basis, there are uh, uh, growing tree pruning schedules and practices that, that we will need to initiate. Um, there will be more maintenance required as those trees get older, so operating budgets will need to increase as well. Um, doing that within the 2.5% uh, that we're limited to is, is a challenge. But uh, we're, we're doing our best to uh, accommodate both of those. But yes, on a go forward basis, as, as these uh, 30,000 trees we're going to plant in the next, between now and 2025, as they start to mature, there will be more demands for, for maintenance and uh, on the trees themselves. And typically, it will increase the uh, fall leaf sweeping programs and, uh, and uh, just trimming and pruning and and whatnot. So yes, there, there will be an increase in, in operating budgets required on a go forward basis. We're not there yet, but uh, we'll be getting there pretty soon as these young trees start to need a, a five year or a 10 year prunings. Uh, thank you. And there was one other, just as I was looking at the report and seeing that we've got two, two reasons to plant. One is urban beautification and the other is climate change. And in theory, Considering we have such a huge city, um, and this would be more a council idea, but with staff help, of the city buying up some land, rural land, and doing massive plantings there, so that we could actually, I mean, if one focus, beautification, but at some point we're gonna have to stop in the urban area, because I do have people that say, I don't want a tree. Um, and there, there are a number of them, there's lots, they're dirty, um, which is amazing, but that's how they feel. So maybe if climate change is a big part of the um, push from the council, that could be a way that we could actually um, combat climate change in a, in a managed way that doesn't involve such an incredible intensity of work uh, for staff to deal with individual homeowners and individual locations. A thought. Thanks. Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to be clear, um, the um, w is staff understanding of the 30,000 trees, new trees, that they're, we're aiming for a net 30,000, or just that we've planted 30,000? You are replacing poor, well, um, dead and sometimes poor trees, that's what I heard. But over the program length, is it the understanding that we're aiming for net 30,000, like 30,000 surviving trees? Through you, Mr. Chair. The intent is to add uh, that number of trees to the, um, to the canopy, if you will. So these are additional trees. On a go-forward basis, as we, if, as we lose some of those young trees, they are replaced. As we uh, remove the uh, ash that we have as part of the Emerald Ash Borer programs, those are replaced and they aren't added to the, they aren't added to the, the, the net new trees. So the same with if we if we take down a silver maple that's a danger it becomes a dangerous tree and then we replace that tree but it's not included in in that thirty thousand so basically yes we're looking at adding thirty thousand additional trees to what we currently have. Good. I just wanted to be sure that that yep. what the understanding was there, yep. and of the CRCA seedlings that are planted. Are they all in the in the either the rural or urban city of Kingston? And 
because it seems to me then CRCA must be planting many more trees than that because there are other jurisdictions and locations where they might do that. To you, Mr. Chair. So the, the seedling plantings uh, came about from some discussions with the CRCA and in 2015 we planted um, several thousand at uh, Grass Creek Park in the, the newly purchased um, addition to Grass Creek Park, if you will, which sort of speaks to the former councillor's um, notion there of, of uh, looking at buying unused land or, or, or adding to our um, municipal grounds and, and planting trees there. So we planted several thousand there and we also planted another uh, several thousand at the, um, uh, where in, in the vicinity of our snow dump off Perth Road there between um, just you know, that backs onto the CRCA property there. The next, uh, we also planted uh, a number um, uh, at that same location this year, and then just north of there, we're going to plant. That's where the 2018 plantings are going to go. So we're 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 using those um, sort of unused open spaces uh, just outside the urban boundary to to put in as many of these seedlings as we can. The, the nice thing about the working with the CRCA is that it helps develop a relationship with our staff and theirs. And uh, we're gonna uh, sort of continue that relationship when we're looking at um, extending the potential valley lands planting, which along, as you remember, was brought forward by a previous councillor. And uh, in that case, we're looking at not only planting on uh, municipal property there, but potentially also um, looking at private properties and seeing if, if we can plant on those EPA lands along the valley lands there and put, put more trees in those locations even though it's on private property. So we're looking at, at uh, all the different options we can. And a lot of that discussion is, has been generated from the work that we've done with the CRCA on these seedling plantings. The seedling plantings program is uh, sponsored by uh, Forests Ontario. It's a very uh, economical program. Uh, it helps the CRCA with, with their goals. And we're, we're talking to them now. It also, uh, there's uh, some warranty on those seedlings as well. So as they uh, die off in the first year or two, or I think it's maybe even extend to three years, they will replant those seedlings. Um, and we're in discussions with them now to um, sort of maybe develop some, some programs that will uh, help more of those seedlings to survive a little bit longer. So it's, we're, we're kind of, we're not putting all our eggs in one basket, if you will. We're, we're looking at planting um, some smaller caliper trees for the spring planting so we can get more trees in. We'll continue with our larger caliper tree plantings in, in the fall. We're still replacing the emerald ash borer. We're, we're, we're replacing any tree that we cut down or we have to remove in the uh, urban area. We replace, and that's outside of the, uh, the 30,000 trees. And when we look at the seedlings, they're looking at uh, potentially, a, a, they're telling us a 60% a uh, survival rate to uh, at least 10 years. Then as those trees uh, continue to grow, they will, they will squeeze each other out. But the end result at, at the end of 10 years is you're, you're going to have a good number of good sized trees uh, growing in those groves. So it's a, it's a very inexpensive way to sort of ensure that at the 10 year point we're, we're going to have a good diversity of, of ages of trees. We're going to have um, uh, a good number of trees in the urban area. As we uh, work out of the EAB program, we'll, we'll shift our focus uh, on more of those urban areas. That's why we're looking at the, uh, the sports fields facilities and some of those bigger parks where there, as Councilor Rose had noted, there, there's very little shade. Uh, we've been approached by uh, some neighbors on some of those parks that have requested that we put some trees there and so we, we, we jumped on that. So we're, we're sort of, um, scattering our, our tree planting program in, in a bunch of different ways to make sure that no matter what happens, one way or another, we're gonna end up with that 30,000 tree goal. Thank you. Um, on the question of people 
who do not want a tree on their property or what they take to be their property. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but when you're planting thousands of trees, who's got time to stop and argue with somebody? That's the way I look at it, <laughs> right? You might have planted two trees one time you had the argument. So, um, but my question is, how, how many of those objections do you get? I'm sure you get them. It's sort of as a percent, with, I'm not asking to be accurate, you know, completely accurate about this, but as a percentage of the total plantings that you're doing in the urban area, like how many do we get? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, I, I have that number. Um, our staff actually have um, 18 addresses where, the, where, where we were asked not to plant a tree. So of the, the, uh, the thousands of trees we planted in the urban area this, uh, this year, we only had 18 refusals. So um, you're absolutely right. It's, it, it, we're, we're better off to um, keep the residents happy and, and go and find another spot. Um, as opposed to uh, spending our time trying to convince them to have a tree. Um, they may at some point change their mind once they see how their neighbor's trees are, are looking and, and decide they want one of their own, but everybody has their own opinions on, on whether or not they want a tree. Uh, some people don't like to rake leaves. I, <laughs> but uh, anyway, we're, for us, we, we want to keep the residents happy, and it, it's really a very small percentage of of the trees that we're planting. So it's it's not really worth the effort to try to uh, argue with them to convince them to, to have a tree. One last question. And this this is a, being down a downtown district this is really important to me. We have old growth trees dying off and sometimes there's infrastructure issues and they have to be taken out. Um, so do we have a program to replace those old growth trees in, in situ. Like we took some out when we developed, the one really big one out near the corner of Brock and, and uh, Barry uh, when we put the infrastructure in. And I'm not questioning that decision so much as, as Mr. Wells knows, we have the issue of having difficult plantings in McBurney Park. And it's been suggested that, I think, was, yeah, um, that we could plant the tree, the new tree, in the stump of the old one. Because we know there's roots under there. We just drill down and then plant the tree right where it is. And that way we avoid the archaeological um, costs in McBurney Park. So it's, um, I'm wondering if that can be done on, this, on, the, on the urban streets when we have to take one out and we not have a program where we plant another one. And I think Mr. Van Buren's thinking about, well, I don't know. <laughs> I understand it's, it's complicated, but beneath the tree, there's usually, a, for some species, there's a big top root and it goes down. And, we didn't put our urban infrastructure right there. Usually it's in the street and it's all about the laterals. So, because I think what I find is people are really concerned about those street trees that sort of make the densely urban area more livable, more environmentally friendly. So, my question is, do we have a replacement for those trees? I'm all in favor of what we're doing, and I think it's good. And so way beyond anything we've done in the past, and, and that's great. I just wonder if we, can, if we have a program for that or whether we could have a program for that. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, once again, the short answer is yes. Um, However, uh, even though there may have been a 100-year-old silver maple in a location, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's the right location to put a tree back in. 
Um, so we, we do an assessment on all those locations. Uh, we make best efforts to uh, replant in the general vicinity of where um, uh, a large mature tree like that has been removed. Because what our goal is, is to have um, a diverse uh, species and diverse ages spread throughout the, that urban core area. So we don't end up in, in another 100 years with a bunch of 100-year-old trees that are all the same age and, and gonna, I'll have to be taken out. So we're trying to spread that out. When we uh, remove those large silver maples in the downtown area, we also uh, grind the stumps down to, to get that out of the way. And typically what we will do is we will, late, we will wait uh, several years until some of the remainder that's in that, still below the ground, has, has softened up and, and uh, dispersed before we replant at that location. That, that, that provides the, the newly planted tree the better opportunity to, to survive. Um, we are looking at a little bit different options for McBurney Park, but that's, that is uh, partly a, a cost issue just because of the archaeological costs associated with trying to plant in that spot. But in that urban area where we have those uh, silver maples, and we've been working on that silver maple program now since about 2011, 2012, we're, we're trying to, to spread out those plantings so that we don't just take out a tree and put a new one right back in the same spot. If it's a suitable spot to put one back in, we'll put it back, we'll sort of hold that in abeyance and we'll put it back in in say five years time or, or our inspector will go and have a look and see if the conditions are right to put a tree back there. So we do have a, a program to put back in those places where it's appropriate, um, and, but we just, we don't do it right away just because of the survivability piece. This is a brief um, follow-up to that. How many years do you usually, do, do we have a list of these locations and how many years do we usually wait? I'm thinking of the one, there was um, the st near York and uh, Barrie, a, a, a tree limb came down, it was the size of a tree, it was like this, right? And it um, took out three stacks, okay? Because it took down the wires and everything. And it, it was examined, they, you know, this tree has got to go. And um, it was removed and it, you can't see a trace of it. So you do exactly as you say. So I don't know if it's an appropriate spot, but somewhere near there should be an appropriate spot. I don't know if the people want it or not. I know one of the people there probably would, but you know, that's a whole other issue. So how long would you wait? Do you have a list in, of locations and how long would you wait to replace? Through you, Mr. Chair. So if I had my tree inspector here, he could probably tell you uh, what type of tree that was right where you're talking about. Um, he has been with us, uh, he started just before I did, or a little bit after I did, so more than a decade he's been with us and he uh, has a, an amazing capacity for remembering what tree is where. You give him an address, he can say, oh yeah, that's a, and he'll tell you what a tree is. Besides the point of that, um, he keeps track of where those removals have come out and he knows when it came out and when he's doing his inspections, he'll He'll have a look at that site and, and he gives us a lot of the information for particularly that downtown core area where those um, silver maple programs are. He's the one that did the initial um, inspection on all those silver maples and we actually redid that inspection again in 2016. So we're, we're to help us continue to monitor those silver maples and, and prune them appropriately and, and where necessary, remove them. So he, he has those lists and we use that each year when we were looking at developing our, our planting program for the year. And just, but just as you, some of the items you, you walk to there, there's, there's a lot of different factors that play into when and where and what type of tree should go to go back in or, or be replaced in, at those different locations. So we look at all those factors, or at least our tree inspector and his helpers look at all those factors 
when we're making those planting plans. So that's kind of the long answer. The short answer is yes, where we're, where we're removing those trees, at some point we are going to put a tree back in. Um, I don't have that schedule, but our, our tree inspector has that list of all those locations, and he, he helps us plan for when's the best time to put a tree back in that spot. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciated the long answer, because now I know what to say to people when you bring it up. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's about eight o'clock, so although you could probably imagine I have lots of questions as well, I'm just going to try to um, uh, sum up sort of my overall reaction to the report and, and what information I still might not have been covered yet. Um, first of all, the report does a really good job of explaining the diversity that you've been talking about, about the approach, the various different sort of pots, uh, of, or uh, different types of trees, different types of programs. And uh, if you just look at the first table, table A, I mean, there, it immediately jumps out at you that the biggest number is the seedlings. But then when you read the report, you, and you, you know you see it's seedlings, you see the 60% survival, which by the way is actually quite good for seedlings. Um, that doesn't say that in the report, that's just my own uh, understanding. But 60% of 8,000, of course, is only 4,800. The die-off in that, in those numbers, is quite high. When you, it makes it basically impossible to really tell, have an accurate tally of, how, of the, thir, you know, how close we're getting to the 30,000. However, the 30,000 itself is sort of, is is an estimate based on the simple strategic direction of double the tree canopy. So it really, whether you get to 29,999 or 35,200, it doesn't really matter because uh, it's, are we satisfying the strategic direction of doubling the tree canopy? And I think in that question, my, my reaction to this report and to the work thus far is, is yes, we are on our way to fulfilling that strategic direction. And that this report does satisfy me in that sense. Um, there's a lot of the a lot of the issues that my colleagues have brought up are, are valid, and, and these are the this is good oversight. I'm very happy that you guys have taken the time to give us that input. But in the overall sort of picture, it's, it's clear that staff is while dealing with the emerald ash borer problem and the silver maple problem, they're also planting hundreds of large caliper trees and collaborating with CRCA to plant thousands of the seedlings. And I would suggest that although it would be easiest, easiest to just triple the seedlings effort to get to that 30,000 number, you'd be, that, that would be the easiest, most practical way to get the number, the volume number in. We were aware that these are trees this big that won't be at the size of the large caliper ones for 10 years. So, and, and then they will, they will encroach on each other and they will further die off like you were mentioning. Uh, so it's a different ball of wax, so that's why you have to have a mixture. And I'm, I'm very happy that, that staff has taken that diverse approach. Um, I do have a question about, about uh, something that you've already mentioned, but just I want it sort of answered in a high level, so I don't know if it'll be Mr. Wells or, or uh, Mr. Keecher who wants to answer this, but in the tree watering program specifically for the young trees, if you look at that table, so, we are, and you've already sort of addressed this, but 2016, 1.75% uh, dead, 2017 spring, 4.5% dead, 2016 was the year of the drought, 2017 was the wet year. Uh, that was this year was wet. So in, in a paragraph below it says, the initiation of the drought protection strategy in 2016 and the implementation of regular watering schedules of the young trees during drought conditions were key factors in the successful survival of these trees. Is, is that all that explains the higher survival rate in a dry year than, the, than, the, uh, than this year? Uh, or are there other factors that were not mentioned here in the report? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair. When we look at the uh, numbers of the the uh, dead trees at at 1.75, even to 4.5 percent, um, compared to the the good percentage of 
of 84.25, 86, and 83%. Um, it's, it's a, you could almost call those 1.752 and 4.5 the same number. They're, they're, they're very low. They're, run, they're, they're below 5%, which is, uh, for us, is, is significant. Um, why that is, I, I, other than what um, staff has provided in the report here, I couldn't say specifically, but it could be, it could depend on the mix of trees we had. Um, it do, does mention in the report that uh, we, we had a particular problem with uh, tulip trees. Um, so I don't know what the numbers of tulip trees were in the different years, uh, for instance. So these are, these are, uh, these are living things planted in various conditions at over three different years, and it's there's a lot of a lot of variances in in what may have happened. I think what this really tells you is that maintaining that low percentage for the trees planted in 2016 really speaks to the effort that we put into watering those trees in 2016. If we hadn't done that watering program, that dead uh, percentage for 2016 would have been significantly hot, significantly higher, and would have been the outlier for uh, or different from from the uh, the 2017 number. So I, I think that's really what it tells us um, why there's that slight difference in those dead trees. I, I I can't really say, and I'm not sure staff could determine that either. But it, it may have had something to do with the species. I'm, I'm satisfied with your initial response that it could just be statistical variation when you're talking about a number that small. Um, but it's clear from the end of your response that staff believes that the tree watering program saved a significant number of young trees in 2016 during the drought. And, so, and that's good to hear because that's a new program, uh, which was the direction of council. So, um, but also the 95% survival rate is excellent. So, uh, and there was many things, a lot of effort that went into that. Just to highlight that the survival rate of the seedlings is much lower. 6% is a good survival rate, but it is, it is much lower uh, than 95, and, and, but the 95% is survival rate of trees that cost 250 to $400 each. So the, the, when you lose one of those, the cost is much higher. So I'm satisfied that the rationale is there for continuing the tree watering program. I'm glad that that's in the report. And, uh, and in general, uh, although it's clear from your responses that you're aware, the staff is aware of the challenge ahead. We are moving in, in the right direction. And, uh, and I think, um, I think the congratulations are in order for the, the, good, the hard work done thus far. And if you could pass that on to your staff, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Members of the public have an opportunity to comment on the report. Point of order. I believe if this is an information report, with all due respect, if this is an information report without a recommendation, do we typically uh, allow the public to speak to it as as a chair of other committees i don't believe that's the usual routine I'm looking to the clerk generally it's the practice to receive questions from the committee followed by comments from members of the public and then uh, if the committee has any comments again um, that's generally how we act including at planning committee where there isn't a statutory public meeting if it's just like an information report that comes forward relating to a internal policy or something along those my lines. I can uh, tell the vice chair that I can, I'll review the committee bylaw uh, before our next meeting, uh, have another look for myself. Uh, I've been going at, at uh, my clerk's prompting. The briefing that we had earlier is not something that come, uh, comes from the public or in order, but there was an information report that accompanied the briefing and if we don't allow, I'll just this is just my personal uh, opinion, if we don't allow public comment to information reports, some items don't get any other type of uh, agenda item. They only come up as an information report and then public would not have a chance to, for input. Yeah. Uh, it, I would appreciate if you check the rules of order because in other committees I don't think 
We acknowledge that, and, there, and it, there's a simple rationale. There isn't a recommendation, so if there's any questions or comments, that can be shared with staff and members of the committee afterwards, and it doesn't affect the outcome. I will I'll review the, I appreciate the, rule, Thank you. the procedural rules for committees. In the meantime, I will allow Mr. Dixon to speak, so go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the privilege. Um, so once again, a very thorough report by staff and excellent answers to the questions from the committee. Um, very impressive overall. I'm gonna um, focus on the points that haven't been dealt with yet. Um, and I'm gonna start with Bell Park because I'm on the working group for this. And there was a 2017 tree planting program there which the committee had input into. Um, and I guess number one is I don't, think, I don't see anything on Bell Park specifically. And I think it would be beneficial if it were to be dealt with in a line item um, because uh, various factors have come in. Um, number one, as the committee has heard and discussed, it was a flood year and staff did cut back on the plans for 2017 plantings at Bell Park. And I think there was also a potential flood damage um, to trees that did go in. So you know, we had input and we had some information, but I would like to see more um, on the survival rate at Bell Park specifically for 2017. And I know that there is also a forthcoming report on, um, I guess, the coastal engineering impact of floods in 2017 from a specialized engineering firm that's coming soon. So Bell Park is probably part of that. And the reason I raise this is because I had trouble getting answers on my questions around insurance with respect to flood damage at Bell Park. And I'm wondering, do we have an insurance policy that covers uh, damage to trees that have gone in? I haven't heard that one come up um, yet specifically. Maybe it's the provider or the circumstance involved. Okay, I think that's probably enough on Bell Park. Um, just going along with some of the suggestions from members of the committee on locations. Um, I may have said some of this before, I can't really remember, but a couple that I thought of um, would be on the um, basically renovated, expanded John Counter Boulevard corridor. I know there's a lot of work still going on there. Um, the overpass over the rail, but just sort of looking at that as a, an envelope there, a corridor, um, as a sort of a plan for what you could do there. And I guess my other one is uh, in certain of the industrial parks. People don't actually live there, but they work there. People are talking more about they want to have trees in the neighborhoods where they live, but that might be one where you can score some easy points. Um, a lot of space out there. Um, I'm wondering if the tree planting program could be coordinated in detail with the waterfront master plan. Um, that was one of the big successes of uh, staff and council and consultants putting that together. Um, so, okay, I guess my, my next question is, uh, there was discussion around the Emerald Ash Borer program. I'm, I don't see anything specifically in the report talking about where we are now. There's 3,500 or so trees that have been identified that are ash that probably have to come out. Are we taking all of them out? And sort of where are we sort of at the end of 2017 on that program? I mean, it is ongoing, so appreciate that going in there. Um, Sorry, just interject. I believe yep. there was another report to the Emerald Ash Borer Program that we received in the last year that maybe you could consult that okay. could answer that last question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I will uh, do, do check that out. And so my final question is, you were talking quite a bit about the details of survival and um, trees dying for whatever reasons. And I'm wondering if you are tracking the survival rates by species as you install them. If you have a program for that. Um, because I know that Keith did a very extensive examination and report on the ideal species for the Kingston area. 
So this would be you know, very good feedback for that to, to see if it is fitting in with um, the work that they did. So again, uh, thanks for the excellent work and uh, uh, all the best for the future. Thank you. In staff's response, uh, keep aware that anything that's not specifically in the report is uh, it doesn't need to be answered uh, tonight and maybe uh, depending on how staff wants to respond, some of those questions might fall outside the scope of the report. Go ahead. So uh, I'll uh, start. Um, um, the, uh, the first questions were a number of specific questions around Bell Park. We did not include this in the report and um, we would just be speculating, I think, if we tried to answer that here, that that is um, run by another department. If the committee would like us to uh, provide some information on that, we could possibly do that at a later date or in another report, so I'll leave it at that. Um, I, I also, um, I'm gonna jump ahead to the last um, comment or question posed, and then Mr. Wells is gonna answer the ones in between. And it was a comment about um, a little more detailed look at species and whatnot. And I'm gonna take that as an opportunity actually to thank a couple of the councillors here uh, this evening who met with Mr. Wells, myself and some staff. And at that point in time, we collectively, I would say, decided to go down the road of um, uh, gathering the data on the success that we were having in the planting of the trees to help us, um, I would say, make some educated decisions on how we go forward. And uh, this was a first stab at that. I, um, I, I think, uh, I, I would say from Mr. Wells and myself, we were um, maybe pleasantly surprised. Um, I don't think we were shocked. I think we thought this it was a pretty good success, but I, I would say that we were a bit surprised. Um, we have listened to a number of comments here tonight about expanding the data that we're collecting. Um, you know, trees planted by um, development, um, uh, um, other departments, whatnot, uh, looking at species in that. I, I think that's something that we can include in this on a go forward basis. I'm not sitting here making commitments as to what that will exactly be, be but this is a good start and we will, uh, we will look to expand that over the number of years as far as the data that we bring back. Thank you. Um, members of the committee have uh, one final opportunity to just speak to the item. It doesn't need to be questions. Uh, this is a procedure I've been following at Heritage as well. Many of you have already spoken. I'm not gonna say anything else, but you have another chance. Okay, there's no recommendation to vote on. So the only other item of business is the next meeting, which is January 16th, the usual time. And uh, unless there are some notices of motion, anyone? No, nope. or motions, no. Nope. So uh, I need a motion to adjourn. Councillor Schell.